Johan, uh, thank you very much uh, for doing this uh, interview with me. I much appreciate it. Um, I want to talk about uh, progress, um, but uh, since you are Swedish and live in Stockholm, I thought I would start with what's the latest uh, with, in terms of COVID in Sweden. And uh, can you tell us a little bit, just summarize very briefly, um, how different is the Swedish approach from the one that we've seen in, say, the United States or the rest of Western Europe? Well, Sweden is the outlier, I would say. It's the one country that I know about in Western democracies where we haven't had a shutdown of society. We haven't closed the borders, shut down restaurants, businesses, uh, gyms, public transportation. There's no stay at home order in place. The one more important restriction is that public events with more than 50 people is not allowed in Sweden for the moment. But apart from that, most of it is based on voluntary social distancing. We are recommended to don't go to work if you don't have to, don't travel if you don't have to, and so on. And it seems, according to mobility data, that um, most Swedes have changed their behavior quite uh, dramatically. And uh, well, the latest uh, in terms of, of COVID-19 is that it seems like we're now past the peak in Sweden. The number of people in um, intensive care has been, the new arrivals in intensive care has been actually been stable for almost two months in Sweden. So it's always been a fairly stable situation without the kind of exponential growth that people talked about. And now, since the last two weeks, we've also seen an absolute decline in people in intensive care and the number of deaths is slowly declining. So with some luck, we are getting past this and we attain more of immunity so that society can get back to everyday life and uh, the elderly can go back into normal life sooner than in other places. Mm -hmm. So is the unspoken goal of the Swedish government to actually introduce herd immunity through the back door, uh, so to speak? Um, and what would be the reason for it? Is the reason that when the second wave comes or third wave or the virus never goes away and we don't develop a vaccine so that when the next time it comes, the Swedes don't have to shut down the society, they can just carry on working? And, and what do you think about that as a goal? Yeah. Well, they would deny that this is the goal. Um, they're saying that herd immunity is its the only way that this is going to end. Uh, but how we get there, that's another matter. Uh, and then they've said, the authorities and the government, that we are not trying to suppress the disease. We are trying to slow it down, mitigation rather than suppression. And the reason is that they think that no one is going to escape this. No countries will be able to suppress this entirely, except perhaps some small island nation somewhere. Uh, this will come back and countries who have been in lockdown, they will see a second wave once they get out of it. So they will end up where Sweden is. The only question is, will it be more painful? Uh, will we ruin and wreck our society and our economy whilst doing it? That's that's the assumption uh, behind this, that um, the only way to um, to escape it entirely is a vaccine. And that might be a year away if we're lucky. And no society is able to shut down for a year. And no one is planning on it, I'm, I'm sure. So the Swedish authorities think that we're going to have to live with it for a long time. And in that case, it's better to slowly get it through the population rather than having this kind of start and stop process that you'll get if you enter a lockdown, you get out of it, you'll get a new wave, then you might get back into a lockdown and then you have no way of planning your individual life or business or, or trade or anything and it might be even more dangerous in the long run for human lives. Uh, would you go as far as to say that um, if the shutdown, like the one that is practiced in Britain or the United States, is successful enough, it will actually hinder uh, the health, both economic but also social health, of the society come the autumn? Yes, and this is the way I look upon this, that it's not about 
saving human lives or saving the economy because the economy is human lives. Uh, because we know that great depressions take a terrible human toll in several ways. The immediate effects of unemployment, of enforced lockdowns with the kind of mental problems, with the uh, domestic abuse that we're seeing, but also in the long run, obviously, less wealth means that we invest less in new medical technology, in drugs, less spending on health care in the long run, and then we'll suffer more in the long run than we would have otherwise. And my personal opinion is that that's, that's it, basically, a kind of precautionary principle rationally understood, because we don't know how to deal with the disease, not just you and I, since we don't have that kind of scientific background, but even the experts are, have a diversity of opinion. So we don't know if the Swedish version or the US version is going to be better in the long run. But what we do know is that lockdowns take a terrible toll on human liberties, on human lives and on wealth in the long run. So a precautionary principle rationally understood would say, try to be cautious now. Don't engage in this terrible experiment that it really is to close down the world to the extent that we've done now. Now, what I find very interesting, uh, switching topics a little bit, is that here in the United States, uh, there is sort of an unholy alliance of Trump and the left uh, basically bashing Sweden for what it had done. So I guess there are a couple of questions there. One is, why do you think that's happening? And, and secondly, um, um, has COVID clearly has become very political in the United States. Has it become political in Sweden? So first, let's look at the American uh, politics and then the Swedish politics and COVID. Yeah. Well, personally, I'm not surprised because this is the kind of new strange political realignment that we're seeing that, you know, Bernie Sanders thinks that Donald Trump stole his best ideas and... Uh, we have Tucker Carlson on Fox News saying that uh, Elizabeth Warren sounds like Trump on a good day and so on. So if there's anything uh, uniting the new nationalist right and the statist left is that they they both want some kind of strong man in charge in Washington, D.C., telling everybody how to run their lives. And uh, obviously the Swedish model is a threat to that assumption, if it turns out that individuals adapting and changing their everyday lives in according to, uh, to, to new data, and they can solve the problems for themselves. Obviously, status to both the left and the right will find this a little bit threatening to, to their worldview, and especially if it's a, sort of Sweden does it uh, far away from, from uh, where you are, and it turns out that you kind of bet on the wrong horse. Uh, so that might be um, one thing. It's obviously become political in the US. It, there is a diversity of opinion in, in Sweden as well. I would say a healthy debate between everybody, um, experts as well. But it has not really become political. Uh, and that's those who have been most opposed to what is happening right now are the, the, the nationalist uh, populist right in Sweden. They have try to argue for shutting down the schools and um, certain versions of lockdowns and so on. But even they have gone quiet right now. And that suggests to me that they are reading public opinion in Sweden as being broadly in agreement with what's happening in Sweden right now. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting you said that, uh, you know, in, in, in Sweden, the government to a great extent trusts that people will make rational choices in their lives and try to minimize their exposure to uh, infection and change their behavior. So uh, on the one hand, there is government that is putting trust in the people to adjust. So we can talk maybe a little bit about um, whether Sweden is different in terms of infantilization of its, of its population in, in America. Um, government doesn't trust its people to do the right thing. But I think there is also the other side of the, of the trust issue, which is that I keep hearing a lot about the Swedish people trusting their government to deliver the best uh, possible outcome. Whereas I, I dare say that in America, uh, 
you know half of the population doesn't trust a government of the of the opposite side and and vice versa so can we can we talk a little bit about trust uh is sweden uh special in that sense or uh, what is going on how do you understand trust i think sweden or at least scandinavia is a little bit different and uh it's not just my reading if you look at polls when people are being asked so do you trust your neighbors do you trust a stranger in the streets or even politicians uh, more sweets uh, and, and Norwegians would say that yes, definitely, compared to to other places. And it goes both ways, I think. Uh, there is more of an understanding from uh, governmental authorities that if they come with a recommendation saying that this is important right now, for example, to uh, engage in social distance, especially if you're over 70, then they generally would trust Swedes to do that. For example, when it comes to inoculation, vaccines uh, that's not mandatory even for the the worst diseases in sweden but more swedes do it than in almost any other place compared to italy where it is mandatory but fewer people uh, vaccinate their kids so there seems to be some something of a difference there and i think this goes a long way back in history some people try to say that this is because of the welfare state and our social democratic traditions in Sweden. But that is hard to um, to uh, square with the fact that um, sweet people of Swedish ancestry in the United States also show the same pattern of trust. And they emigrated to the US 150 years ago, a long time before anybody thought of social democracy or, or the welfare state. So I think it goes further back in history to our our history of not having had feudalism, so we're not used to having an aristocrat uh, abusing and exploiting us constantly, no foreign invaders, no wars for 200 years, no dictatorship. So it's the guy in charge is probably something like you are uh, the descendant of self-owning, property-owning, small-scale farmers, and he might be your second cousin. I mean, it's a small country, so it's you think that they're not there to abuse the position. They have not come from a strange place to uh, suck the economy dry or, or anything like that. They're probably there to try to do something approaching a good job. I want to talk to you a little bit about your article in The Spectator last week, uh, which was very, very good. Uh, you wrote about the problems with COVID modeling, which, after all, is underpinning so much of what different governments in different parts of the world do. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your thesis, the, the, the modeling thesis, and what are the lessons to be drawn from it? Well, it just begins with the uh, basic realization that all the models were garbage because they said and um, the projections that they came up with, and some of them just a month ago, said that at this time, right now, we would have uh, 30 to 40 Swedes fighting over every intensive care unit bed in hospitals. So we would have such a dramatic um, lack of, uh, of places in hospitals, of ventilators and, and so on. And now it actually turns out that right now we have an extra capacity around 30%. So it's just sort of uh, 0.7 people fighting over every ICU. Um, and that tells you that something has gone wrong in, in those models. Obviously, the future is always strange and uncertain. But one of the things that I think went wrong when you go back and look at their papers is that they have n had no space, no column for voluntary changes in behavior. They had mandatory lockdowns and various degrees, or they had business as usual. Nobody changes their behavior. And I think that completely underestimates human nature and apparently completely misunderstood what went on in Sweden, because we had lots of spontaneous development uh, changes in, in behavior. And that's one factor. Um, but that cannot explain it all, because it turns out when you read them carefully, uh, two of the papers that I looked closely at, both of them thought that even if Sweden at that point, one month ago, or a little bit more, um, 
even if Sweden chose to implement the harshest version of European lockdowns and shutdowns of society entirely, we would still have a 10 patients fighting over every ICU in Sweden right now. So we would have a, a collapsing healthcare system and tens of thousands of deaths by now. And that has clearly not happened. So it's also trying to understand the world by setting hundreds of parameters, manually just trying to come up with uh, some sort of percentage probability that you uh, lessen the mitigation. It's, it's close to useless. So why do you think that people uh, in general and politicians in particular um, accepted these models as scripture, so to speak, and reorganized societies to fit uh, with those models. Um, uh, it seems to me that implied within what you are saying uh, in your criticism of these models is that not all science is created equal. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that and what is the proper place of science in, in society? Yeah, there is a difference between science to understand the world and to understand what is going on and science as an attempt to uh, model the future without really much of an empirical uh, basis. Some of these models, they clearly just used the historical pattern until now what had happened in the past months, and let's just set the parameters so that the model can explain what had happened until now and see what will happen in the future, which I think, uh, or at least it looks like now, that is close to, to useless. And I think that one reason why they became so influential is that, well, there are 3.5 reasons why that's the case. No, there's not. But when I say 3.5, you pay attention because you think I've really done my homework. And we, we've learned that through psychological experiments. When you give a precise number, it sounds like you're on top of things. And um, I think the more, the closer you get to, you know, we'll have a, a, a deficit of, of a factor of 34.5 in ICUs in Swedish hospitals. That captures your attention in a way that it doesn't when you say, we think we will, run out of capacity because of these factors. And so modeling, um, precisely because it gives us those precise numbers and scary trajectories, we pay attention to them. And also, they're, they were so scary. They looked awful. I mean, they scared me as well into thinking perhaps I should just sort of get a quick healthcare education for over a couple of days and just run to a hospital and try to save as many lives as possible because it's, it's so scary. And that's also something you and I know about human psychology. Scary things, dramatic, shocking things, we pay attention to them. And when they sound precise, it's enough to, in some places, get people to switch policy completely. As I think there's a fair argument to be had that Britain changed its, pol its policy because of models like this. Could it also be um, that politicians operating in a very uncertain environment and obviously trying to minimize risk to their careers, uh, their political parties and so forth, um, were very happy to outsource the decision making basically to the scientific community saying, uh, well, look, it's out of our hands. We can't really make these decisions because scientists are saying as one thing, we, we have to follow what, they, what they're saying. So is, is there sort of a uh, self-preservation aspect to this, do you think? Yes, it's obviously it's, it's nice not to be responsible. <laughs> and uh, But I think what they've done quite often is that they're then hiding behind the scientists and the health authorities. Uh, for example, it seems like that's the case in, in Britain as well, that uh, the prime minister's close advisor, Dominic Cummings, told the independent scientific advisory board that it would be really useful if you argued in favor of a lockdown right now, because that would help us. And two days later, they did. Um, because I don't think it's really true that they're yielding to um, to scientists and experts. It's more like they wanted to seem like they are 
yielding to them. Because this is really something that set Sweden apart from some of our neighbors. In Sweden, they really have yielded, in a way, politicians to the experts and, and listened to them and said, okay, let's not lock down in that case. Whereas we heard in our neighboring countries that the Norwegian Public Health Authority said that, no, don't shut down schools. That will be incredibly painful for families and we'll lose important workers and it won't help us with mitigation. But the government went ahead anyway. In Denmark, uh, the public health authority said there's no reason to shut down our borders. This is just a political decision. And it was a political decision. So a, especially when we're all traveling blind, you don't want all the responsibility, obviously. You can hide behind uh, expertise, but you can also hide, I think, behind what other countries are doing. And that's a debate that we've had in every country. Why aren't you doing what China did or Italy or Spain did. And this has been one of the major arguments in the Swedish debate. Why should we go it alone? Everybody else did this. So it's more like, you know, how herd immunity has become a very loaded term in, in the debate. But I think uh, this herd mentality that we're seeing in decision making is much, much worse. It would be amiss of me if I didn't mention that, of course, you are a very famous proponent of human progress. Um, maybe you wouldn't call yourself a, uh, an optimist, but a realist, and the realistic picture of the world is much better than uh, than most people assume. But uh, I would borrow Matt Ridley's phrase and call myself a rational optimist. A rational optimist. Uh, I think that which is really the same as a realist. <laughs> And so, um, has has COVID shaken your uh, your rational optimism about long term uh, long term potential for our species? Well, absolutely not, because um, optimism, at least rational optimism, has never been about thinking that we'll never face any problems. <laughs> Look, mankind, we we just have a, we're going to have a good time, not having to worry about anything, because problems they are. Um, they're part of the world and the universe, and we're going to get them. We've always had pandemics. We'll have pandemics in the future as well. Now, progress is a um, term that relates to human behavior and how we are changing and adapting the world to our needs rather than a, a sort of a metaphysical worldview. And then I would say that uh, I think that we have already seen that uh, the belief in human progress has been really uh, confirmed by this crisis because never before in mankind's history have we responded to a new pandemic this quickly. I mean, we can read the genome of the virus in, in six days, a technique that didn't, technology that didn't exist uh, until 1995. And you know how the world is screaming out for new ventilators, every hospital needs it, but in the year 1950, we had a total number of one ventilator on the whole planet. So that tells you something about how we've always had pandemics, but for the first time, we now have the scientific discoveries, the technological innovations, and the human wealth, so that we're, for the first time, able to uh, strike back against these, uh, these horrors. What is the one thing that you would like our viewers to sort of take away from uh, uh, not just our discussion, but what you have observed about COVID since its start? I mean, you're obviously in the middle of it. You've given a lot of interviews. Um, how would you provide the, the viewers with a tonic um, or, or a lesson to take away? Well, um... Well, let me start with, with something a little bit hopeful, even though uh, we should always um, be a little bit cautious about that in the middle of a crisis. But this, the, the virus in itself and the disease in itself is not as bad as we thought it was going to be. This will not be a new Spanish flu. Uh, it will be awful. It will be terrible. It will kill thousands and thousands of people around the world. But it doesn't have that. It doesn't seem to have that combination of um, um, being spreading that quickly and being as dangerous as to uh, kill tens or hundreds of millions of people around the world. And in that case, and, and 
luckily it seems to spare most of the young. And I mean, had it been, had we had to worry about our kids as well at this time, that would have seen apocalyptical in every sense. Uh, so we are getting through this and what we can think of it is this in, is in a way a test run of the next pandemic because sooner or later we'll get a new pandemic of those apocalyptical proportions. So this is the time to learn some lessons about uh, what works, what doesn't work, why weren't we better prepared, what can scientists change, what can uh, hospitals and what can governments change so that we're better prepared the next time when death comes a knocking because in that case we might save millions of lives so everything that we're doing is a is a learning process and that's also one of the reasons why i think that the world should be grateful for the swedish model because it seems like everybody else is experimenting with one way of approaching this disease. Uh, well, then we need at least one country attempting another solution so that we can learn from it uh, the next time around. So, so that's my um, my one hope for the the future. If if there are other, other lessons to be drawn or a, or a message to the viewers, it's, it's a twofold one. First of all, historically, pandemics are almost always followed by more close societies, unfortunately. It's somehow it triggers our psychological immune system uh, and we become more afraid of the world, of people, of foreigners, of international trade, of being dependent on supply chains that are global and um, often we build walls after this period and we, we're going to have to be prepared for that kind of argument or at least sentiment uh, in the future I'm afraid because that will make us less prepared. For, for problems in the future. But on the other hand, the lesson I think we should draw is that, look, this was a preview of a horror movie, the horror movie of, uh, you know, a combination of Greta Thunberg and um, uh, Steve Bannon running the world. Nobody's traveling anymore, no migration, no mobility, no trade, no offshoring. And, you know, it's not as nice as it looked in the ads. Uh, this is awful. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, we just shut down the world for two months. And the result is already global depression, mass unemployment, and in poorer countries, m mass poverty and uh, hunger and starvation in many places. So if you have had that preview of the horror movie of a deglobalized world, why would anyone want to make that permanent? Thank you very much for joining me today. It was wonderful. I really appreciate uh, the time that you have given us. Thank you so much, Mary.